Okay, I guess we're live. Um, good morning, everyone. This is a joint meeting with both the House and the Senate Ag Committees with folks from uh, rural Vermont as well as Nofa, Vermont. And I uh, would like to welcome all of you to our to our joint meeting. Uh, and to start with, I guess we ought to introduce ourselves and and you folks can, uh, the guests can introduce themselves as they, as they speak and and uh, get on, get on the program. Uh, I'm Bobby Starr, and I chair the Senate Ag Committee. Hi, uh, Chris Pearson, Senator from Chittenden County, Vice Chair of the Senate Ag Committee. Welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Anthony Polito. <clears throat> excuse me, Anthony Polito, Washington County Senate. Corey Parent, Franklin County. I'm glad you caught on there, Parent. Um, I'm looking for Collimore. <laughs> we also have uh, Brian Collimore is a member, but he had to go uh, report to another committee on a, on a bill or, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to introduce your House members or have them introduce themselves? Sure, thanks, Bobby. Uh, I'm Representative Carolyn Partridge, and I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. And I'll go to Rodney. My name is Rodney Graham. I represent the uh, Orange One District, which is Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Corinth, Berkshire, and Chelsea. All right, and Tom Bach. I'm Representative Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and North Springfield. Thanks, Tom. Terry? Uh, Representative uh, Terry Norris. I am in the Addison Rutland District, towns of Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and All right, uh, John O'Brien. Good morning, I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. I'm gonna mute the member from Ovine there. Also, it's hometown of rural Vermont's Caroline Gordon. <laughs> As you may be able to tell, John is a sheep farmer. <laughs> um, all right, uh, oh my gosh, who else is here? Uh, Vicki. Good morning, I'm Representative Vicki Strong from Albany, and I represent seven towns in Orleans, Caledonia counties. All right, Heather. Good morning all, Heather Supernat. I represent Windsor 4-1, which is the towns of Barnard, Pomfret, Queechy, and West Hartford. Thanks, Heather and Henry. <laughs> Excuse me, Henry. Hi there, Henry Pearl. I represent Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. Great, thank you. So we're all set. Um, well, uh, again, welcome everybody. And the first uh, person that I would like to call on is uh, Carolyn Gordon, uh, who's, uh, Caroline is the director, uh, legislative director for rural Vermont and appears uh, before us from time to time on a host of ag issues. So good morning, Caroline, and, and welcome. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first um, virtual Small Farm Action Day um, here meet and greet with legislators. So I'm really just here to uh, set the stage a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I appreciate all the senators and uh, representatives time to, to speak with us here today. The farmers uh, followed an open invitation to, to use this as a, as a forum to present what's um, issues that arise for them really personally on their farms um, and whether they are within or without um, beyond our policy priorities of rural Vermont and NOFA Vermont. So also welcome Maddie Kempner here with me today. And um, so what you hear from the farmers today will, will uh, may or may not reflect some of our policy priorities. It's really a chance for farmers to engage in advocacy, learn about the legislative process, and hopefully build some relationships with you all. 
So um, with that, I, I pass it on and I'll also have to excuse myself. I will pop in and out of the meeting, but I have um, also my colleague Graham Unens Rufenacht here for, uh, from Rural Vermont, uh, if, if necessary to field question. And otherwise Maddie will be also here to, to help guide through the event. But with, without further ado, um, thank you all for coming and um, enjoy your presentations. Yeah, thank, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Caroline, uh, Stephen, Leslie, uh, Cedar Mountain Farm, uh, are you with us? Yes, I am here. Yeah. Chair Starr and Madam Chair Partridge, Senators and Representatives of the Ag and Forestry Committees, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Stephen Leslie, along with my wife, Carrie Gwalt, operate Cedar Mountain Farm, a 24 Jersey cow dairy and one and a half acre no-till CSA market garden established in the Upper Valley in 1996. We are also partners in Cobb Hill Cheese. Both our businesses are located at Cobb Hill Co-Housing in Heartland. I want to talk with you today about soil health management systems, why I believe this approach can revitalize our agricultural economy while providing immediate and long-term solutions to the challenges of climate change. Using the Nutrient Management Plan of the Natural Resources Conservation Service as a model, technical assistance can help land managers develop soil health plans. The aim is for long-term adoption of practices with commensurate long-term financial and technical incentives. At Cedar Mountain Farm, we have a successful track record of working with federal and state funded programs. For instance, it was through a collaboration with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board in tandem with the Upper Valley Land Trust that Carrie and I were able to purchase an affordable unit and have access to arable land at Cobb Hill. We also participated in the Farm Viability Program, which helped us to determine our actual cost of production for pricing our products. Later, we engaged with the Equip Program, completing a series of projects over a 10-year contract that included infrastructure for intensive management grazing, enhanced irrigation capacity for our market garden, covered manure storage facility, compost stacking pad and more. Having ourselves been beneficiaries of collaboration with these partners, we see great potential for enhancing the promotion of healthy soil practices more broadly. The strategy is built out on the already existing programs of the state, federal and NGO advocates in order to coordinate and amplify their collective impact exponentially. The offices of the regional conservation districts could serve as administration centers. Higher yields and enhanced resilience can be achieved through adopting practices such as cover cropping, crop rotations, composting, mulching, perennial crops and agroforestry, adaptive multi-species grazing, organic reduced tillage and no-till practices, adaptable to market gardens, broad acre crops, and all livestock operations. Investment to help land managers to, uh, to adopt these organic regenerative practices have proven to be the most cost-effective way to sequester carbon. The five basic principles of soil health developed by the NRCS provide a rubric. All practices should be seen as comprising a synergy of effects to restore the totality of landscape functions on the farm or forest ecosystem. And this incentives would no longer be granted piecemeal for specific practices. Rather, participants would be aided to develop comprehensive plans. This is the path for creating a spiral of regeneration. Soil health management systems would allow for the land manager to apply for assistance on a variety of practices under a single contract. This would increase enrollment and voluntary compliance. In 2019, the average farm income in the US was negative $1,200. We cannot expect farmers with annual operating debt and long-term debt to be innovators and risk takers. Dairy farmers in particular must invest enormous amounts of capital in equipment, infrastructure, inputs, and labor. I think we all agree that incentives are a favorable approach over regulations. Successful pilot projects and farmer to farmer training are proven methods for accelerating the adoption of healthy soil practices. Each land manager would have a team of technical assistants performing regular site visits to monitor and assist in implementation. Site characteristics and social context would be taken into account to ensure an equitable and just transition toward organic regenerative management. Since it is not practical to measure carbon sequestration, water quality, and other enhanced functions on every farm every year, UVM should get additional funding to conduct trials and monitor pilot farms to establish median averages resulting from the implement of soil health plans. 
farmers will be expected to do document all practices. Human civilization is completely dependent on ecosystem services. Let's ensure that payment for ecological services is not restricted to cleaner water and carbon sequestration. We need a holistic measure of all the ecological, social, and economic benefits our farmers contribute to Vermont. We need to take into account all of the landscape functions of a farm or forest and how restoring these contributes to the health of the entire bioregion. Forests under management for old growth characteristics can provide a local sustainable supply of forest products while acting as tremendous carbon sinks. Agroforestry practices including silviculture, silvopasture, alley cropping, native species hedgerows and riparian buffers all enhance soil and water quality. Not only do local organic regenerative farms sequester carbon and restore habitat, they also reduce the overall carbon footprint associated with food production by eliminating chemical inputs, reducing tractor use, and reducing transportation through local distribution. Oh, and I'll wrap up here. To face the challenges of abrupt climate change and loss of biodiversity, we need progressive soil health policy reflective of a shift in societal priorities where soil is recognized as basic infrastructure. We need to ensure that those who can produce food, medicine, fuel, fiber, and building materials while regenerating soil are guaranteed a living wage the same way we do for all other essential service providers. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Stephen. And uh, just for your knowledge and the listeners, um, we, we and the House Committee both have worked quite a bit on um, ecosystems um, uh, here this session. And I know the House is sending us a bill dealing with it. And we on the Senate side um, are going to be voting on a bill, maybe in the full Senate, that passed through our committee and through appropriations yes, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, giving uh, uh, ecosystems. Uh, a working group, um, Ryan Patch's group. I don't know if you've worked with Ryan, but we're we're going to fund that if it gets through the house um, at a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit this year uh, to move uh, that that forward, and with some money to so we hopefully we'll start uh, helping people that want to grow. Uh, Healthy soils, uh, a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of money to help them move forward. So, just pass that on. Um, our our next um, Bobby, could I just interrupt you? Just so sure. you know, <clears throat> the extension of the payment for ecosystem services working group has was is in the housekeeping bill, and it has already passed the house. It should be on its way to you. Oh. Yeah, how much money did you put in that? We did not. <clears throat> we did not put any money in it. That's your job. Well, I guess we're <clears throat> we already did. I hope, uh, but it'll be your job to keep it in when it gets back to the house. That's okay. Um, we're on so it. That's that's good, and and you could raise that. I'm sure, maybe. Um, <laughs> So we have uh, Reverend M. Uh, Murata with us uh, next. Um, um, so Reverend, are you with us? I am, thank you. Yes, there you are. Yes. Hi, my name is Reverend Moretti. I'm with Murmuration Farm in Fairfax, Vermont, Franklin County. Um, thank you so much for inviting us here. I'd like to speak about the, the limits on on-farm slaughter. Uh, the limits placed on the amount of livestock that can be slaughtered on farm is a barrier actually to my growth as a farm and a new enterprise. I would like to understand the legislature's intent behind the placement of a limit and rationale for the limits applied. I appreciate the decisions are typically made in response to a question or a problem, but I've yet to be able to learn what the original problem had been uh, so I cannot thoughtfully make a proposal on how to increase or remove the limits. I'd like to explain for you how these limits on the slaughter of animals on my farm also create a limit for myself, for my business, and for my community. 
I've had a hobby farm at my homestead since 2003. It began with a large garden and a few chickens, and as with many small farms, incrementally grew in both volume and variety. I added pigs to my farm in 2015 and have been breeding and raising them since. My position in population health at Northwestern Medical Center in St. Albans was eliminated at the time public quarantine began a year ago. While quarantining at home with my disabled son, I decided to pivot to make my farm my primary occupation and income. Uh, instead of attempting to re-enter a potentially unstable corporate situation. Within a few months, I had over 150 animals thriving on my property. I also began to produce dog treats, freeze drying portions that my customers ordinarily do not take when harvesting an animal. I combined the raw organ meat with fruits or vegetables grown on my land or local farms to create freeze dried supplemental food that have become more popular than I had expected. I do not send my animals to slaughterhouses. Most of my animals were born on my land and have been cared for and cared about by me from the moment of birth until their moment of death. Not only do I conduct a ritual of gratitude prior to harvest, I also ensure that they are completely at ease and calm when comes time to slaughter. This is important to me and to my customers as this ensures there is minimal adrenaline or stress-related hormone released into their system to alter or taint the meat. Some do not believe that this is a thing, but you cannot convince my customers otherwise. Were I to send my animals to a slaughterhouse, I am at risk of losing customers. Being a live product, an animal's growth is unpredictable. I can influence it, but cannot control it. I make a commitment to my customers to harvest when the animal reaches agreed upon market weight. When they do, I call the slaughterer and butcher and make the plan. This ensures I'm delivering the quality product that both my customers and I insist upon. If I need to book an appointment to slaughter an animal that might not even have been born yet, I run the risk of having to slaughter prematurely or having to give up a slot and therefore not having the opportunity to book another. I'm left with an animal that cannot be slaughtered and a customer with an empty freezer. I am not interested in sacrificing product quality for convenience. When my pigs are harvested, I save the tracheas and deliver them to the local EMTs so that may, they may practice intubations. I don't know about you, but if I were in a situation where I needed to be intubated, I would like to have a provider that is skilled, practiced, and confident. Having this tool available at no cost is an asset to my community. I have delivered pig's feet to the nursing school so that students may practice sutures. A pig's skin is very similar in texture and reaction as human skin, and this gives a hands-on learning experience for these practitioners. Having this tool available at no cost is an asset to my community. Were I to send my animals to a slaughterhouse, I would not be able to provide these tools to providers. I use many of the organ meats to make dog treats. My business is dependent upon being able to use as much of an animal that I raise as possible. Were I to send an animal to a slaughterhouse, I would only be given the organs deemed safe for human consumption and the rest of this valuable product would be destroyed. My access to literal raw material would be greatly diminished and my ability to meet customer demand crippled. This would put a severe limit on my ability to grow as an independent Vermont-based business. I did not know about these limits until I began doing my research around what I needed to do to become a viable farm. I harvested 28 swine last year. If not for a convenient slide of the calendar, I would have gone over the annual limit and faced repercussions. I intend to harvest at least 25 swine this year and I'm adding goats to my land. I don't have the luxury of that blip in the calendar this year and I'm faced with the choice between turning my back on my customers and community or not complying with the law. The current on-farm slaughter limits are a barrier to my ability to grow and sustain a new farm and related enterprise. 
I am interested in working with you to develop increased limits that meet the needs of the farmers and the original intent of the legislation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, uh, but on the swine uh, on farm slaughter, is it done by numbers or by weight? I know it's either one hmm. or the other. Well, the uh, it says by numbers, but the form that I report on is by weight, so it really doesn't it doesn't um, cross over. Yeah, and just to answer your first question real quick, and then we'll move on. Um, when we put that into statute many years ago, um, we we had a very rough time getting it even passed and uh, it was that's one reason why the numbers are in there and so low um, it was it it was rough I, I believe there was a sheep farmer from up your way um, that wanted this uh, so he could do his own sheep at, at home and and but I know we had a hard time getting it passed, but it's time has come to raise that limit. Um, uh, we haven't had, to my knowledge, one one problem with on farm slaughter, and uh, so I think it's time has come to to look at that. But so, anyways, um, I'm sorry. Can I can I ask a question? You said you had a hard time getting it passed, meaning allowing for on-farm slaughter or putting a limit on on-farm slaughter? No, to get it, just to get it passed. Uh, the ag, ag agency and the head of them, uh, the meat division back at that point in time was, um, it was really rough uh, uh, getting them to budge on it. And, and um, you know, that has all changed, I think, to some degree at the present time. So, yes. uh, Senator Pearson. Maybe you already said this, Mr. Chair, but the federal government's really uptight about this idea. So, you yeah. know, everything we do, if I understand, is sort of tiptoeing around uh, their concerns and, and trying to stay in compliance with federal law. Thank you. Yes, but uh, anyways, um, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, we actually really should look at. Uh, we, we on the Senate side um, did put uh, a half a million dollars into um, helping to advance our slaughter facilities to, uh, so we could increase the output. Some, some slaughter facilities are behind a, a whole year if you wanted to take uh, an animal to a slaughter facility. And um, so we are beefing that up. Maybe the House, um, when they get that bill in their committee and the Ag Committee, they could do a little work on on the on-farm slaughter because the issue, it would fit right into uh, our our proposal that we're sending over. So, so anyways, we'll uh, we'll keep uh, an eye out and try to help you with that situation. Um, Alan, uh, no Jericho uh, now. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for. Welcoming us today. My name is Jericho Bicknell. I run Crooked Sapling Farm. Can you hear me okay? Last Not time I had really. to shut off. It's, my... kind, okay. it's kind of a hit and miss. I'm going to turn off my video. You can hear. I apologize. Okay. So <laughs> I'll start again. My name is Jericho Bicknell. Thank you so much for letting us come and talk to you today. Um, I run Crooked Sapling Farm in Newark, Vermont with my husband and our two children, Lyra who's six and Amos is two years old. Um, we have a, 
a small flock, but growing flock of Icelandic sheep that we raise for fleece and for meat. Um, and we have about 80 laying hens, um, which we, we sell eggs. Um, and we practice intensive rotational grazing. So um, in the summer months, we every day we're moving animals around about eight, eight acres of pasture, um, really trying to do the best we can for the animals and for our land and soil health. Um, it's very important to us. We've also planted um, many fruit and nut and shade trees uh, throughout the pasture. So um, none of the fruit trees are bearing yet, but in the next few years, we should start to get some apples and plums and cherries, hopefully, fingers crossed. It's pretty cold up here, but. <laughs> um, and um, yes, yeah, so we're just, we're trying to um, do the best we can for this, for the land and for our animals and for ourselves and our community, growing um, quality, fresh, nutritious food. Um, uh, this year will be the first year that we're actually um, trying to sell lamb. So I wanted to speak a little bit about some of the challenges that we have encountered um, in uh, meat processing um, today and in hope that it'll encourage, it sounds like there's a lot of good um, support for the on-farm slaughter exemption, which is great. So encourage continued and increasing those limits um, and also any uh, further efforts to ease the, the meat processing bottleneck. Um, we have had a lot of interest from our community in buying lamb um, from us, but but much, many people hesitant to commit to a whole animal. Um, so the first thing I looked into was trying to uh, do retail and ha have our animals slaughtered at an inspected facility, but quickly found that everywhere is booked up through 2022. Um, and we are on a waiting list, um, but in the meantime, we still have to have a plan for slaughtering our animals in case we don't get in <laughs> to the slaughterhouse. So um, we are planning to do on-farm slaughter, and um, and but even with that, uh, the butchers near us are all also incredibly busy and booked. The um, the custom butchers and. So the only date we had to um, pay, have a date of August 20th to do our slaughtering, which is much earlier than we would normally. Um, that's about one or two months earlier than we would normally slaughter. So it means our, our carcass weights are going to be lower than, than we would hope. Um, so um, yeah, so that's, that's our experience. Um, and I'm so grateful that there is an on-farm slaughter personal use exemption that allows us to even sell any of our meat <laughs> this year. Um, and I just hope that um, that this can continue in the future and also um, further efforts to, uh, like um, Senator Starr mentioned, increasing the, the retail, the capacity, the slaughterhouse capacity um, or other ways of, of um, easing that, that bottleneck in the state. Um, so thank you again um, so much. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you Jericho. Uh, we're getting an echo or something. Um, and um, hopefully um, the half a million dollars we put into the slaughter facility on, on the Senate side, uh, hopefully, by this fall, it may it may open up some slaughter facilities um, to do some advanced um, advanced uh, machinery uh, expansion, and and there's also money there to help with uh, at VTC to set up a training uh, program for meat uh, processing. Um, but uh, if you had an itinerant slaughterer, if you could find one of those folks to come to your farm, that would probably get you out of a bind for 
for this year. Um, but uh, good luck to you. Um, and if you know, if we can help get hold of Caroline or Maddie, and and um, you know, that's what we're in Montpelier for is to help help you folks. Um, Alan uh, Rites, uh, Director of Public and Governmental Affairs at Hanover Co-op. I see you, Alan. Good morning. My my well, thanks to you, um, both chairs and members of each committee. A uh, quick introduction for those who are vaguely familiar with the Hanover Co-op Food Stores. Hanover is a New Hampshire name, um, but we very much have some strong and deep Vermont roots. Uh, we were founded in 1936. We're among the oldest food co-ops in the United States. Adam and Co-op is a few months older than we are. Um, and we're the second largest uh, food cooperative in the US. So that gives us some heft and some muscle but also responsibility. And it is the reason that I'm on the call today. And I wanted to just uh, give um, everyone on the call a little bit of a background on our Vermont roots, but also how we are involved in the local food shed and some serious issues we see. So to tick off a few of the fast facts, um, our Vermont locations in order that they were established We've had land in Norwich, Vermont since 1973, and since 77, it's been the home to the Norwich Farmers Market. We have a large uh, co-op kitchen. It's a production facility in Wilder. We opened that in 2000. 2010, we opened our White River Junction grocery store, which has just been a fantastic community grocery and uh, just seems to improve year after year. That's about a 15,000 square foot store. And as of early 2019, we opened our second auto service center um, on Route 5 in Norwich. And oh, finally, I'm speaking to you from our administrative offices in White River Junction, um, up um, in the area behind the big post office in White River. So our payroll of Vermont employees is about $5.2 million. I only add that to say that, you know, we're, we're bullish on Vermont. We've, as you could tell by those years I ticked off and the growth and the investment, this has uh, been a, a wonderful state to be involved in. And especially when it comes to sourcing local and regional food. Uh, this business spends about $16.5 million within a hundred mile radius with small producers, farmers, um, specialty food makers, cheese makers. About two thirds of that money is spent in Vermont. Vermont is just a, a vibrant sector of hardworking people that bring great products. Uh, let's fast forward to this pandemic that we've all dealt with. Um, over the years, we have made that commitment to local and regional agriculture and it paid off when the pandemic hit because we were already sourcing from local uh, meat suppliers and poultry producers. Um, but when the pandemic hit, everything changed but when small independent grocers like ours, and even though we're an $85 million business, we're still small in the big world, um, we were able to have the muscle to quickly check and, and have secondary and third level relationships. And that's important when you've got a food shed that's vibrant. About 12 years ago, we really were suffering from the bottleneck in the meat processing industry. So a store like ours is able to refurbish our meat cutting rooms. We have full service butcher shops in our stores. So we changed it so we could bring in hanging weight of lamb, pork, um, beef. And we always cut down from primals, grinding everything from whole cuts. And so we were able to alleviate some of the bottleneck. You know, it helps a farmer and other um, distributors to help us bring in a hanging weight of something. And that helps, but this, the bottleneck is still so critical. And when we think of those small producers out there, as, as Jericho had just met, or the, um, it might have been Jericho who mentioned um, the processing elements, you know, there's only so much we can do. Um, right now, in my role, I'm working with Rural Vermont, VTC, Vermont Sustainable Job Funds, in some very early conversations of how we can help with apprenticeships or help with just supporting the idea of training and adding our voice to this important job. Um, NOFA Vermont is, is just been such a strong partner as has New England Farmers Union and Vital Communities. So where does this all take us to? Training and career opportunities, as well as the processing plants. These are interconnected. There's no way around them. 
Um, you know, as I said, we're a big store. Um, we're able to refurbish a back room, but a lot of the smaller food co-ops and the small independent grocers, they're not in that position, but they would gladly promote and offer more local products from Vermont when it comes to our livestock and poultry farmers. So my ask from all of you is actually an offer. Um, I'm in a position to add our voice and my sleeves are rolled up. So I would say when it comes to legislation or insights from a, a retailer perspective, I'm here, I'm at the table, and I look forward to supporting anything we can do to strengthen the food shed. Whether a product ever comes through our doors or not, it's our responsibility to be part of this conversation. And I thank you for letting me be part of this one today. Yeah, <clears throat> well, th thank you very much for that, um, for that offer. Uh, Alan, um, if you could get hold of Pat Moulton at VTC, uh, as far as training, uh, they're going to be setting that up, the training for meat processing. And the two, you may be able to, you know, have, have be part of that. I'll, I'll uh, and thank you for that suggestion. I'm actually going to be on a call with Pat tomorrow tomorrow morning. So uh, the wheels are rolling and yeah. uh, a lot of work to be done. So we're here for it. And and just for your information, tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to be hearing about the VTC farm that's in Norwich and that's sort of in trouble uh, with the, you know, it's, it's not a good situation and we're gonna be talking about that um, tomorrow morning. So okay, hopefully um, something good will come from that. And, uh, um, and I hope so. And there's a, um, a, we know of a few other uh, vendors that bring, our, bring their material to our back door who are also in some very difficult situations. Yeah. Uh, next is Heidi Copper Train. Copper team. Uh, Heidi, are you with us? Um, Senator Starr, we didn't get con full confirmation that Heidi was going to be joining us, so she may not be here, and I don't see her. So you can probably move on to the next person. Evan, Evan Holt. Hello. Uh, my name is Evan Hoyt, and I'm very grateful to be here with you all. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm um, calling from Huntington, Vermont. I am a part of Brushbrook Community Farm and Bakery. Our farm functions really differently than most, so it has unique challenges and interactions with state policy. I hope to introduce the project and talk about some specifics of where it interacts with state policy. Uh, these include uh, current legislation around employment law, as well as the on-farm slaughter legislation we've been discussing and raw milk production. Uh, those are a few particular challenges. So uh, Brushbrook is an experiment in alternative modes of food production. We seek to offer reparations to the more than human world. And the main way we do that is by building relationship. We attempt to build relationship by offering food as a gift. So instead of transaction as the atomic unit of transfer, Gift offers a way to move food or equipment or even labor and money in ways that in our experience has a great capacity to strengthen relationships and allow goods to flow to where they're needed the most. So we are a farm and a bakery and we do the work of food production, but we do not sell anything. For example, the soup we make from the bodies of our grass fed cows and local vegetables is offered at no charge. After all, we received the beef and the broth at no charge, and they were made possible by an abundance of grasses, which in turn grew from freely given sunlight and rains. So we see our work as farmers as participant in this massive flow of food and energy. I recognize that this may seem far-fetched or extreme. In some ways though, we see what we do as doing what humans have done the world over in times before markets were imposed upon cultures and people who celebrate generosity and discourage accumulation. 
A result of our first year of this work is a thriving community of growers and eaters. Our farm functions in some ways a lot like a regional food hub, but entirely based on gift. Without the challenges or stigmas associated with food shelves, nor the cost prohibitiveness of organic farm stands, we've been able to distribute measureless bread and soup to our neighbors. The community in turn has supported us, giving us financial gifts enough to keep the lights on, buy the wheat that's milled for the bread, and pay a few of the farmers a humble stipend. We're also able to persist financially by not owning or renting any land. Just like we glean vegetables from nearby farms, we glean unused pastures and greenhouses in Huntington Valley with permissions from the landowners to make use of what's otherwise fallow. In many ways, Vermont state agricultural policy has enabled us to do the work we love. And I'm grateful for each of you for your work and for your role in that. <laughs> In some other ways, projects like ours have some unique hurdles to jump. For example, employment law, which is based upon preventing capitalist exploitation, is designed to ensure employee wellness, but actually prevents us from having the relationship to our working community that we seek. The contractual transactional employer employee relationship is not what we're trying to replicate, but current law demands that the stipends we use to keep the gift economy running result in that dynamic. The opportunity to one day opt out of those requirements in order to maintain that gift-based volunteer relationship would be of huge service to our community. Secondly, <laughs> on-farm slaughter restrictions prevent us from having the relationships with the animals that we feel we owe them. The law prohibits farmers from participating in the slaughter, despite the farmer's lifelong relationship with and care for the animal. While a provision for sharing with non-paying guests allow us to share the meat in some capacity, restrictions on gifting the goods is a hindrance to us. Additionally, this season, we will reach limits for both cow and sheep on farm slaughter and request that those limits be increased in the future so that we can spare the animals the traumas of anonymous placeless deaths. This would also allow us to provide local meat without competing for slaughterhouse time uh, pre-scheduling slaughters as has been discussed and without passing those associated costs onto our community when these are services we can provide. <laughs> Lastly and briefly, raw milk restrictions prevent us from sharing the work and gifts of our heifers in the way that we would like. Tedious policy requiring customer contact record keeping prevents gifts from flowing outward in a way that we feel would enable equitability and food access, which is what we're all about. Those are a few of the specific policy related barriers our community faces. More generally, we've observed that a lot of legislation is written with the assumption of markets and business as the underlying model. This can make interpreting the law for our project and similar projects very difficult. I hope the wording and content of the law can one day better support gift-based farms and that our project can demonstrate that non-market food production is a viable route for Vermont farmers and eaters. Though some argue for the competition and complex efficiency that markets lead to, markets also require most producers to make financial profitability their primary goal, firmly above even the care of the land, the wellness of their eaters, and the closeness of their community. From the perspective of eaters, markets enable quick transactional relationships with food producers or just distributors and lead to a distance between themselves and the place and people that bring their food into being. Lastly, markets determine who has access to the food that the land and life on earth is producing. Uh, it does this in a system that disadvantages people in dozens of clear and well demonstrated ways that we know about. So for these reasons and more, non-market food systems are an emerging response to the troubling times we're in. It's my hope that the many folks who are willing and able to do the hard work of food production for their community will be supported by the state in the future, even and especially if their efforts exist outside of the pervasive market context that we're accustomed to. Thank you for listening, for the time, and for your consideration. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Evan. Um, we we did hear testimony this morning from the, the house. Uh, I don't know if Heather's still on or not, 
uh, they did take up a bill that altered the raw milk uh, issue to some extent. And I don't know if, if that movement would help in your particular case or not, but uh, they did, the House Committee on Ag has worked on, on the raw milk issue, trying to make it easier to, uh, to I guess, sell, sell it or to take it to a neighbor's uh, uh, TSA to dispose of it to, to their customers or people. So you might want to check with the health committee on that. Uh, if it needs more tweaking, uh, get hold of us uh, because the bill is going to be in our committee next. Um, so thanks for being um, with us this morning. Uh, Jane, um, is it um, Lanzi? Uh, Jane Lanza. Lanza? Yes, Jane Lanza, that's correct. Uh, welcome. Thank you for listening and for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Jane Lanza. I run a family farm with my husband, Ben, and our two young children called Family Tree in Sheldon Springs, Vermont. I represent our family and other rural small farmers like ourselves throughout the state. We are requesting reformations to Act 164 such that the adult use cannabis market in Vermont includes a farm to consumer license and participation options like cultivation, resale, delivery on site consumption perhaps outside of whether a town opts in or not. Our particular town, Sheldon Springs, felt legalization was too confusing to pursue this year and shut down our repeated requests to opt in or include this on the ballot. We considered collecting signatures to petition a special meeting to push reconsideration, but it felt wrong during the pandemic to go door to door. On a personal level, we're concerned we may be left behind neighboring towns. We don't have the ability as an established physical farm to pick up and relocate like a larger outside company might based on which town chooses to opt in or not. On a community level, we're concerned our town could be left behind other towns. And while this inequ inequitable distribution of potential opportunity in the craft market is potentially hurting the individual in the town, it more so impedes our progress as a state with respect to the rest of the states in the nation participating in a craft market. The very nature of Vermont craft business is that it is open and inclusive and to hinder participation from all regions and all Vermonters hurts the growth of this industry at large. We're internationally celebrated for our maple, our cheese, our beer, and hopefully soon for our cannabis. What makes Vermont special is the diverse number of local craft contributors to these agricultural products. The land, people, and spirit of this place are unique and are unparalleled. Why not establish a thriving craft legal market here, embracing the spirit and place of these people. There are current and budding, pun intended, cannabis companies like mine throughout the state that are already committed to regenerative agriculture and sustainability, working closely with the Agency of Agriculture for compliance and safety. We are one of many successful craft farm to store hemp product companies in Vermont who have already adapted to changing state and federal requirements and gone above and beyond for transparency with our lab testing and safe packaging. Together, grassroots companies like mine have already started to build a cannabis market here in Vermont that is putting our CBD quality above many other qualities from other states nationwide. Nonetheless, my company, Family Tree, has been denied bank loans, grants, and many business development programs, as were hemp farmers. And this isn't considered a specialty crop in Vermont. Why deny small farms and minorities equal opportunity to participate in the cannabis market because our town won't opt in? With all of these parties involved, as is proven here with CBD, CBD, we could have a thriving craft community in Vermont and become even more so a huge tourist destination. The position taken through limiting participation to opt in towns makes exclusive opportunities and puts one farm at a better advantage than another. Having spent ample time in legal markets out West, we've come to understand the integrative benefit that a legal adult use industry can have on local economies. Our organic hemp grows hillside with water fed by Sheldon Springs. 
In the late 1800s, Sheldon, Vermont was the leading water resort of the United States based on the healing minerals in the water contained here. Right now, Sheldon, Vermont does not have a single tourist destination. Our vision, inspired by the success of the craft beer industry in Vermont, is to revive agritourism and to connect people to the land. We love what we do. We are scientists, we are farmers, we grow organic. From soil to oil, we handcraft everything as a labor of love. Our uniqueness is from our practice, our history, and our land. For years, my husband and I each have wanted to work in cannabis, but not leave Vermont, our home state, our passion. Our goal is the opposite. It is to bring people to Vermont, to stimulate agritourism, and to restore young people's relationships with the land. We have gone out west to learn a lot in legal markets, but we have not left Vermont and we are patiently waiting for Vermont to catch up. We launched our CBD product line during COVID, a global pandemic, not realizing that would be the case. And despite the downturn in the economies throughout the world and locally, our hemp farm is profitable and it's growing fast. My husband and I have left behind our career in engineering and wellness to pursue our dream of buying our family farm and being good stewards of the land for our children. We do not want to return to jobs where we're forced to commute out of rural Vermont, put our children in daycare with limited options, and give up on this dream of caring for our family farm because there's no opportunity for us to participate in the legal cannabis market, where in other places it shows that CBD just gets left behind THC. We would love to see direct avenues for small businesses with quality processes and products to succeed in the legal cannabis industry. We are requesting that the Vermont adult use market include a direct farm to cons consumer license with consideration for farms reselling their crop, perhaps delivering or on-site consumption. Small Vermont farms and CBD companies deserve participation outside of whether their town yeah. opts in or not. Thank you for your consideration and thank you for listening. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, I'll call on our vice chair of Senate Ag, uh, Senator Pearson. Maybe you can give a little overview of where we've been, uh, Chris. Yeah, I, 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 well, just just one point. I, I mean, I agree with a lot of a lot of what Jane's saying, not all of it, but just to make sure it's clear, the towns opting in. First of all, the Senate that was not our position. We didn't want that at all. It was part of the compromise with the governor and in the House, but. Um, the only uh, piece of the uh, possession stream in the cannabis world that requires a, a, an affirmative town vote is having a store. So if you wanna cultivate, if you wanna process, you have to get a permit, but you don't have any, there's no local authority to stop that from happening. So uh, just, just wanna make sure that that's clear. Um, I appreciate you responding. I have been told the latest is that it is still up for debate as far as cultivation and wholesale go, and that that not, might also be required opt-in. No, not at all. The, the law is okay. real clear that it's just for the stores. Uh, we we were trying to get a compromise that said towns could opt out, but we wouldn't have had a bill if we did that. So um, anyway, no, it's just for stores, just for retail. And uh, so, so there is an opportunity, um, you know, once it's once we're a little further along to to have a processor, to have a grow facility, whatever. Thank you for clarifying that. So farmers have a direct route to participate in the market as is, regardless of the retail license. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, you just got to build a little. Can they sell? Could they have a? an addition on their house as a store is that have to be a separate building chris uh, uh do i don't think <laughs> well you'd have to get the town to agree to sell uh, you know to let you sell i don't know that we have looked at the detail of what building you'd have um and you could do that on a farm but you'd have to get a a, a permit just like you would in the downtown winooski or whatever so how would you do if you can grow it but not sell it? You would sell it to a processor or, you know, or to the retail, you know, you'd have to establish a connection to a retail seller. Yep. Uh, thank, thank you, Jane, and thanks, Chris, for uh, bringing that up. Um, 
We have uh, Sam uh, Bromberg next. Is Sam with us? Hi, I'm right here. Uh, there good. you are. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak with you all today. I know that the pressures of everything going on in the world in Vermont today are pulling all of us in a tremendous number of different directions. So I truly appreciate the time that you were sharing with me and for giving me the opportunity to explain to you why cultivating cannabis is definitely farming and why the industry needs to be inclusive and accessible. My farm, Mountain Fire Farm, is located in Danville, Vermont. We are a small but growing farm. At our farm, the priority is on soil health. We currently have about an acre of no-till and regenerative style beds used on a variety of vegetable and fruit crops. And we also raise a growing number of pigs and chickens who we utilize to help enhance the quality of our soil. We also make a fair bit of maple syrup without reverse osmosis and using wood as the fuel. So we try to keep things as handmade as possible. And uh, looking out the window today, I, I think I'm gonna have a little bit of work to do this afternoon. Uh, I'm here today as a resident a taxpayer, a neighbor, and a farmer. I'm going to be blunt. Cannabis is a plant. It grows in soil with sunlight and water. But unlike every other plant, there are those who are attempting to regulate it as if it weren't a plant. Many people and organizations are proposing, advocating for, and attempting to enact laws that won't allow this plant to be cultivated outdoors by the very same farmers who cultivate all the other plants that we consume in our lives. And for a lack of a more eloquent eloquent way to phrase it, it just isn't right. As a farmer, I firmly believe that the act of cultivating cannabis outdoors and under the sun is farming, and I believe that any and all farmers should be able to grow this cash crop if they so choose, with proper regulation, and it is that simple. As a taxpayer, resident, and neighbor, it is because I believe that starting from scratch is inefficient, ineffective, and costly, and that most of the issues surrounding cannabis cultivation, such as product safety, water quality, public health, and the use of potentially hazardous chemicals are already issues that are being addressed by our absolutely outstanding Department of Agriculture. So I firmly believe that we should allow the same organization that is already doing a phenomenal job ensuring the safety of our food supply chain and the safety of those who work within the chain to have as much input as possible regarding the regulation of cannabis. To me, it just makes sense. I'm not here today to lecture you or attempt to educate any of you about the failures of prohibition. But the evidence that prohibition has failed surrounds us here in Vermont, where it is nearly impossible to go anywhere without being reminded about our incredible craft brewing industry. It is promoted as a tourist draw. It is recognized as an industry that has successfully created jobs. And it is an industry that Vermont can be proud of. I firmly believe that it is high time for Vermont's cannabis industry to become another avenue of great pride and commercial success for Vermont, so long as it is regulated in a manner that allows for inclusive participation. Two of the factors that drive the success of the craft brewing industry in Vermont are accessibility and innovation. As far as accessibility goes, any Vermonter who has the drive, determination, and the ability to navigate the licensing process is able to legally own and operate a brewery and sell their product to the public. Innovation does not exist without accessibility, and industries do not succeed over the long term without innovation. I firmly believe that to have a flourishing cannabis industry in Vermont, we must recognize that the outdoor cultivation of cannabis is farming, and just as importantly, the industry needs to remain accessible to anybody who would like to partake in it. I thank you all very much for sharing your time with me today. And the last thing I would like to add is an offer that I've made to many senators and representatives that nobody has taken me up on, which is that if anybody has any questions about cultivation, drying, processing, or the products that are created with dried cannabis, I am more than happy to take some time and give you a lesson on what all it entails. Thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate you all giving me this opportunity today. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, I, I don't know where to go with, with what you said, other than I believe we're, we're trying to move in that direction. It's, um, it's uh, like pushing water uphill, I guess. Uh, the Ag Committees haven't really been 
active players in the, in a lot of the discussion, and um, maybe in the future, you know, we will have to take a a more active uh, active role. Um, but anyways, thank thanks, uh, Sam, for your comments. Um, we have uh, Buster Caswell, who's an activist working on uh, farm labor housing. And um, welcome, Buster. And, uh, and everyone else, thank you for your time. Um, everyone getting together and having discussions on various topics. Agriculture is very important. So thanks to uh, kudos to Will Vermont and kudos to the agriculture community for listening to our agriculture community. Um, that being said, um, I'm gonna comment on the last gentleman. Um, I happen to know a little bit that hemp is a plant. When my grandfather was alive, he talked about that plant and he had a book of agriculture. My grandfather was a horticulturist and he worked at Clausen's greenhouse. So uh, hemp is very much a valuable part of agriculture and should continue to be in the state of Vermont. So anyways, my main subject has been for the last few years has been the advocacy and folks learning opportunities that are available and should be considered throughout the state. Um, some of these opportunities I talk about in three main areas. One of them is rehabilitation, rebuilding, and upgrading present on the farm farms. The other one is the opportunities for farmers to build homes, create homes and opportunities on their farm. And the third opportunities would be for building farms for farm workers in our agricultural areas, which can be successful and should be utilized in many, many ways. And why is this important to agriculture? Very much so. I read a little bit of the um, great work the Ag Department report in there. And parts of that report, there's priority strategies. And in those priority strategies, it talks about the collaboration between housing organizations and leaders and other organizations to come together utilizing present resources and having a conversation. And why is this important to rural Vermont? Let me read from you just a little bit, and this can be found on the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition's website, okay? We all know our agricultural workforce has many challenges and it needs to grow. And part of the reason is Vermont is very rural and in that website, it says Vermont has the second largest affordability gap for renters of any state in the nation. So that's, that's out of 50 states. And Vermont being rural, that gap 
affect our agricultural community. And we need to look at those challenges and how we can address both the combination of growing our agriculture and at the same time challenge this affordability gap. And farm workers overall make low income. And that varies widely among every agriculture, whether you're talking about the folks out in the fields working the soils, or you're talking about processors and the cheese plants and so on and so forth. So that's why we need to collaborate together, possibly come up with a committee, one or two, to address the needs and the challenges so we can continue to grow our agriculture communities. And I hope this discussion moves us forward because it relates to agriculture and it relates to housing. The affordable ability gap is challenging. So as unique as this challenge is, um, it's not impossible. And we need to connect the missing link between working together with the housing community and working on the affordability gap, working in our rural communities and how it works and is connected to agriculture. And I'll leave that um, discussion to all you folks because you guys are the true leaders and everyone has a voice in this. And my suggestion is that just maybe form a committee in the future. And thank you all for your time and leadership. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, Buster. And from our last conversation that we had, I think I sent you a little email. Uh, we, we have been working with BHCB and, and their director has agreed to uh, help farmers uh, receive grants and, and money toward uh, improving farm labor housing on the farms and and um, so we'll we'll stay on that and hopefully um, you know we'll see some some action there. Um, Kat Buxton, um, are you with us, Kat? Vermont Healthy Soils. There you are. Yes. Welcome. Hello, Senator Starr. Thank you so much to all of you for. Um, being here, uh, and thanks to Rural Vermont and NOFA Vermont for putting this event together. Um, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm here mostly just to listen, but since I've been given the opportunity, I, I would like to um, promote as, as best I can for you to work on legislation that promotes regenerative ecosystems. I know there's a lot of discussion about what that word regenerative means. Um, and how we can build our soil infrastructure to support the, the life that we all depend on. Uh, water quality, uh, infrastructure, flooding, et cetera. And I suppose what I'd, what I'd really like to know, and, and I wonder if the legislature is working on this at all, to understand what are the infrastructure damage costs associated with ongoing rainstorms, uh, and especially in terms of soil loss, and how could we invest those, what I assume are actually billions of dollars worth of um, damage costs, how could we invest that into the hands that manage our land to turn it into a soil sponge to support all of the services uh, that we need from our ecosystems. Uh, again, thank you so much for providing this time and, and listening to my short request. Yeah, well, thank you for being with us, Kat. Uh, I think if you've been on this morning uh, throughout this uh, hour or so, uh, we have, we did, um, 
put uh, uh, 250,000 into Ryan Patch's ecosystems program, which is, you know, they've been working at this for a while over there, but with no funding. And uh, that, that did pass through our Senate uh, Appropriations Committee. And I know the House has worked on ecosystems. Uh, the, as far as knowing the cost of what it actually has cost us in soil loss with the heavy rains, hopefully, you know, healthier soils, better soils, uh, uh, more grass uh, over soils will help prevent that in the future. And so we're we are working on issues to to try to keep our planet a, a better place to live and a healthier place to live. And we'll, you know, we'll keep at it. And, and with the help of, you know, folks like yourself and others on the call, it um, it works. You know, we can, we can get a little money and, and move forward. So thank all of you for your hard work. Um, May I ask a follow-up question? Uh, yeah, as long as it's not too hard. <laughs> okay, I think it is pretty hard. Um, sorry for that. Um, I will let you know that I am, um, I do have a seat on the Payment for Ecosystem Services and Soil Health Working Group. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm delighted that the Vermont um, Ecosystem Stewardship Program is getting some funding. I think that must be what you're talking about. That's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. I, I'm really interested in connecting the economic impacts with ecological treatment. And I've yet to see um, the cost uh, no. of these storms. And I just wonder, um, is there an agency um, that is uh, uh, responsible for, and is it something, is it a question we even ask, how much do these storms cost us and can we project that future damage uh, and think about savings. I I would think that with all the people that that we have at Ag working on water quality and soil loss and and A and R, I would think they must have somebody or a group of people that could come up with with some estimate on that. And in your you know, if you're part of the ecosystems working group, you might, as a group, might be able to request that um, from the agency of ag and and get something moving forward at that level as well as us at the, you know, at the state level. So it, it, no, it would be good to have those numbers. Uh, Janice Rinkley. Janice let us know she ended up not being able to make it. So we can go to oh. Suzanne. And Suzanne uh, Long. Suzanne has computer problems and can't get online either. Well, I'm glad it's not us chasing people away. I'm here, uh, I'm here, I'm here. I just have to oh, get on. Yep, here we oh, are. You are, you made it. I, I did. And the phone's ringing and I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, um, welcome. Whew, whew. Um, yeah, internet issues. There's another topic, huh? Yeah, you're the only one that's ever had a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, my name is Suzanne Long. Uh, and I, uh, my husband and I run Luna Blue Farm. I noticed in Alan's talk when he was on line there, he had an old picture of Tim and I on his desk from the co-op there. <laughs> that was a little blast from the past. Um, uh, Tim and I have been farming um, organically since uh, 1989. We started in New Hampshire, sorry to say. No, it's fine. And then uh, I think we moved to Vermont in 91. We're a diversified farm with vegetables and livestock. Um, our daughter um, is taking over our livestock operation. Um, so that whole uh, issue of farm succession and, uh, and land access and affordability is 
also key on our mind. Um, let's see. Um, when we moved to South Royalton, um, you know, we've, we've sort of built this farm from the ground up. We didn't have a lot of outside resources. We've really depended on the income from the farm to build this farm. And it's taken us uh, 30 oh. some years <laughs> to finally um, be able to breathe a little. Um, and when we moved to South Relton, um, we had a pretty strong connection with all the dairy farms here. Um, I think I was a relief milker for most of them, including David Ainsworth, um, Bob Hull, the, the Spaldings, Rob Howe. Um, and I say that just because um, it's so easy for us to think of all the different agricultural enterprises as in their own little silos. But in fact, you know, we're really dependent on each other. Um, you know, we, we're vegetable growers. Um, you know, that's a big part of our income, but we also raise livestock. So we do depend on, you know, our neighbors who, um, for hay, for example. Um, I don't know if they really depended on me to do relief milking, but <laughs> But um, I bet they do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was one way I could contribute back. Um, and I, I just wanted to touch on some of the um, issues that are uh, sort of being addressed by the House and Senate currently, and maybe also with the picture of that interconnectedness of farms and how um, the vibrancy of other farms can affect your farm. Um, and I think the other thing um, is resilience. Um, we are all more resilient if we have more farm neighbors, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure things and um, supply chain issues um, that start to fall apart if you don't have a vibrant agricultural community. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the raw milk bill and um, actually also bring up the Norwich farm issue a little. <laughs> um, and then touch on the adequate housing bill and the, um, the bill that is working with food in our schools. Um, and all of these things do touch on resilience for our farms and for food security. Um, I think with COVID, we've really, um, it's sort of brought up to us um, the fragility of our food systems and then also how our food systems are set up and, and um, when things break down a little bit, what kind of effect it can have on our farms. Um, so I think um, Vermont, as Vermont thinks of new and innovative models, I think that will start to really build um, the success and resilience of our farms. Um, so I see that the, the raw milk, uh, and I wanna say also, you know, food safety, I think is a very important, um, a very important thing. And I think farmers really recognize that. We know that if there's an issue with food safety, it's gonna affect all of us. So, and I think it is also very important to recognize the great asset we have with our Vermont Extension Program. They do an amazing job helping farmers make sure they're meeting those food safety standards. And I think, you know, when, when they ask for money, <laughs> um, give it to them because they do a tremendous job. Um, and when we're thinking about bills that 
um, deal with raw milk and on-farm slaughter, I know that food safety is a big concern. But farmers are aware of that and linked with the work that UVM Extension does to make sure the training is there for safe handling of food. I think Vermont is, is in a great position. Um, just now, to, just to the details of um, the raw milk bill that's now just come across to the Senate. Um, I think that bill will be a great way for those dairies, the tier two dairies, to be able to expand their markets by being able to sell their milk to CSA farms and farm stands. It, so economically, it's an economic boon to those farms that have already taken those expensive steps to be that level of uh, food safety <laughs> and uh, handling of their milk to be able to recoup some of that by being able to expand their markets. And it will add to CSA farms and farm stands ability to provide product that is wanted in the community in a safe way. It's, a, I think the way the, as I understand the way the bill is written, it's a good way, it's a good next step. Um, Vermont has been cautious in their, in their allowing of raw food, raw milk, but I think we've seen that we haven't had some issues. And so I think we're ready for that next expansion. It would help our farm. You know, we, we have people ask us about raw milk and it, they would be delighted to be able to get raw milk from us at our CSA. Um, now I'll jump quick to the Norwich farm issue um, and the VTC. I know it's a really complicated issue. Um, there's a lot of crazy history there, it sounds like. I do want to say, though, that the Norwich Creamery, the Norwich farm, um, is another innovative model that when we think about dairy in Vermont and dairy surviving in Vermont. The Norwich Creamery has been a great model. Chris and Laura have done an amazing job with that little creamery. Um, and it also shows, uh, you know, another model of resilience. When COVID hit, they were, they were, they had their little farm stand that um, they were able to take our produce <laughs> Um, in that in that springtime when we our greenhouses were flooded with spinach and we needed we couldn't do the farmers markets we had another pretty much a direct market through them so this is just an example of how you know these smaller farms can pivot and they can help other farms pivot um, you know so anyway that and I think um, the issue with VTC is complicated. I think, um, unfortunately, um, if VTC got that, was gifted that land, and they are not willing to work with uh, Laura and Chris, who they brought to that place with a five-year contract. Um, and Laura and Chris have built that uh, business and they are trying to work with BTC to be able to buy that infrastructure that the state and the federal government has put lots of money in building up, you know, through grants. That's our taxpayer dollars. We've built up this great little infrastructure in Norwich, Vermont. And as I understand it, VTC just wants to be able to sell that at, at, at market prices for development, tear down that structure and 
and just sell it for whatever they can get for it. It doesn't make any sense. We've already spent a lot of money. We've already invested in that facility. It gives me pause when I hear that now they want to do a on-farm slot or a slaughtering program. <laughs> what, what's gonna happen? <laughs> anyway, I mean, VTC, we love VTC. So I'm really conflicted. We want, we want VTC to survive, but I really don't know what's happening here in terms of VTC as a training place for agriculture that is then not supporting an entity. So I think it's, it's a complicated issue, but I think as a local farmer, knowing what this creamery has done to uh, enrich the, the local food economy in the Upper Valley, it just doesn't make any sense to tear it down. So there, I believe that. <laughs> Yeah. And I just want to quick a couple few things was um, I know that there's uh, legislation to promote um, uh, school lunch programs, uh, support school lunch pro programs. And one of the, that part is um, to fund um, schools to be able to buy from local farms. And I know we've done that in the past, maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, there was some pretty good funding for uh, schools to be able to buy from local farms. And that really enabled us and other local farms to um, do a lot more with schools on a regular basis. A lot of farms support the schools and they want to help schools have good food for the kids and they end up donating um, food. And that works sort of, but it's not, it's not always what the school needs when the school needs it. So I think, you know, if we could figure out a way to um, enable schools to more easily purchase food locally, that will help farms, it will help schools and that whole connection with schools and farms. I've been involved with farm to school forever. That's the problem. I've been farming too long. I have too many feet in different things. Um, and then just another quick uh, thing is uh, that I don't know what the bill is, but I know there's a, there's a talk about adequate livestock housing. And I think we want to make sure that the language is clear or there's some clarification that that um, regulation for adequate livestock housing does not hinder um, uh, intensive rotational grazing. Um, that's something my daughter is doing. It's, it's, that's good for the land, good for the health of the animals. But if the animals are needing to be coming back to a barn, <laughs> that, um, does not, that does not always work for the kind of grazing that um, we're doing to build the soils back to cat. And, um, you know, those are, those are some of the things that are really uh, building soils, sequestering carbon and all those great things that we want to be doing. I could talk about many other things, but I'm not going to. <laughs> well, but. Some, someday when it's slow, Jesse, uh, <laughs> we'll call you and you will keep us uh, build in. Um, but thank, thank you very much uh, for all that you, you've given us. Um, and we, uh, you know, as far as the Norwich farm, uh, we just heard about what was transpiring there day, maybe yet, day before yesterday. And as I said earlier, we've got the uh, president of uh, VTC coming in tomorrow, as well as somebody from the Upper Valley Land Trust and somebody from the citizens group, I hope, that's trying to save that. But I, I, I certainly agree with your opinion on, on that farm and, and what's there. Um, yeah, we lose enough farms 
already without uh, an institution change, chasing them out. And so anyways, we're, we're on to that. And our universal meals program got voted out of our committee, Senate Education Committee, uh, and it'll be an approach, I, I believe, this afternoon. And hopefully we'll move that forward. And there is a provision in there for uh, schools to buy from local farmers. And, um, and so anyways, we're doing that. And we got to run because um, we've got another meeting at 1230 and we still got uh, Jesse. Uh, is Jesse with us? I am. Good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Good morning. Um, thank you for hearing me this morning. Uh, my name is Jesse Lucas. I own yeah. a farm in Charlotte, Vermont. We have an organic 5.5 acre USDA certified organic and real organic certified farm. It's operated by myself and my brother and a dear friend of mine. We produce high quality organic vegetables, greens, and cannabis. On our farm, we have a 13,000 square foot Dutch Venlo greenhouse. Um, we have a Ornwa tunnel, and we're adding more tunnels this year through the NRCS. Um, why we got into farming, we wanted to be able to support our families, contribute to our communities, promote a healthier lifestyle by providing local fresh organic produce. Um, we saw an opportunity with this property that we purchased three years ago, and we believed with this greenhouse we could sort of have a future in horticulture, uh, especially with climate change. There is a need in agriculture for younger generations to adopt technology to improve production, reduce costs, and ultimately increase profitability. This is the only way to make farming a viable career choice to ensure farm success and feasibility. We strongly believe in strict organic practices, building living soils, crop rotation, companion planting, cover cropping, and no-till practices. We continue to farm because we enjoy the hard work, the daily problem solving, the autonomy, the satisfaction of growing, consuming our own food, and actually contributing to something meaningful to us in society. We aim to be at the forefront of contributing to research, sharing our data, our knowledge, and our journey. And we hope to inspire others to begin farming. And we want to share our experiences and collaborate and ensure that around all this around us elevate as we continue to grow our farm. The reason I would like to be able to take this opportunity today and thank rural Vermont, NOFA, and all of you, and to speak sort of um, on Act 164, which is pertaining to um, cultivation and the sort of rec market that we're going to see. My concerns are sort of allowing cultivation on land zone for agricultural use. The cultivation of cannabis is fundamentally an agricultural activity. As we've heard earlier today, Act 164 includes too many arbitrary regulations and places too many barriers to entry onto local farms that prevent them from fairly participating in the emerging legal market. We would like to see an allowance of outdoor production on land, the use of infrastructure and agricultural easements zoned for agricultural use in the current use at any scale of outdoor production. <clears throat> um, outdoor cultivation of cannabis and infrastructure directly related to on-site outdoor cultivation, as with other agricultural cultivation associated associated infrastructure shall not be regulated under VSA 24 chapter 117 local zoning land use regs. We would also like to see um, the eligibility to apply for grants, technical assistance, education, and agricultural programs and benefits to include cultivation licenses that allow for breeding and sale of seed and plant starts. My other sort of points are around sort of craft licensing as we've ever heard, also heard today, a primary objective of 164 extension transition Vermont's, as we know, illicit businesses around cannabis into a legal marketplace and that require a fair and equitable license program. Under the new law, only state registered dispensaries have their licenses completely defined, allowing them to get out rolling as this new law goes into effect. However, licenses for Vermonters are not completely defined and that's a barrier to entry for small businesses. As a result, we would like to see an entire craft licensing system and vertically integrated small farm license for Act 164 that does not require the approval of the Cannabis Control Board and is offering an ongoing and unlimited 
basis and a cost amenable to Vermonters. Craft licenses include a cultivation retail processor, wholesaler, delivery license, and more. The craft license application should be differentiated from non-craft license applications by fewer requirements, uh, a less onerous practice, and a more affordable cost, which would be uh, fixed in the price. There should be no limitations on the number of craft license holders in the state. Uh, we would include the differentiated caps on production and sales of licensed indoor mixed light and outdoor scale, approximately a one to two to four ratio, uh, indoor mixed light and outdoor tier permitted systems. Um, the only requirement that we already know about is the background check. Uh, craft licensed tiers can sell products from and service only craft cultivators, craft licensed towards the only license per capita or cap license would be restricted in the opt-in clause. Craft licenses will only be able to transact with other craft license holders, craft retailers would only be able to resell products by craft cultivators and craft processors. Craft processors will only be able to process for craft cultivators and wholesale craft retailers. We are basically trying to create a equal opportunity in this emerging marketplace, which we do believe falls under ag. And thank you for hearing me out today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jesse. Um, and um, you know, we'll we'll deal with that as it comes up, I guess, uh, in the Senate. And uh, we'll move on to Maddie. Have you got some closing remarks, Maddie? I hate to rush you, but we've got to be on yeah. the Senate floor in just a few minutes. So. No, absolutely. Thank you for letting us go a little bit over our time. And I don't have any of my own testimony to share. I just want to say thank you so much to all the members of both committees for having us, for hearing from so many diverse farmers, food producers, um, and growers today about such a breadth of, um, of issues. And we're grateful to you for all the work that you're doing this session. And just please you know, consider us a resource as you have been um, to reach out on any of the issues that were touched on today. We're happy to connect you with any of the folks that testified here today and other folks who may uh, be able to provide you with some expertise on issues that you're considering. So um, just thank you so much again. Yeah, well, thank you, Maddie. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, for you know helping to set this all up i know it's a lot of work when you do something like this and and we certainly appreciate that um, and so on behalf of both the house and the senate uh, i'd like to thank all of the folks that you brought in today uh, certainly appreciate the diverse group and and the good testimony that they all gave um, uh, so uh, with that, uh, if any of your folks, you know, contact you with issues, uh, you know, feel free uh, to contact, um, contact us anytime, uh, which you know you can do, and uh, we'll, we'll deal with that. So uh, thank you, committee members from the House uh, and my fellow senators, and uh, on our side, we'll see you in a few minutes at the next meeting.